Welcome everyone to the Fermentation Association's webinar of Kombucha, New Code of Practice with founder and president of Kombucha Brewers International, Hannah Crum. I'm Alex Lewin, a fermentation enthusiast, educator, and author. I'm on the advisory board of the Fermentation Association trade group that, is, that was launched to support producers who use fermentation to create delicious and often healthful food and beverages. The Fermentation Association has the goals of helping to educate consumers about fermentation and its benefits, supporting scientific research into those health benefits, and working with food safety authorities to establish clearer and more appropriate regulations in regard to fermentation. Please watch for our upcoming webinars too. We have our next one on Friday, August 7th, that's in a weekend, two days, um, when I'll be talking with co-author of Koji Alchemy, Rich Shi, on a subject near and dear to me, demystifying fermentation and learning to love mold. Go to fermentationassociation.org to register for free. And you all know where that website is because you've been there in order to register. Um, today, we're going to talk with Hannah about the rationale for and the process of establishing the first code of practice for kombucha brewing. Hannah and her partner, Alex Ligori, founded Kombucha Brewers International in 2006. Is that right, Hannah? 2014. Sorry, 2014. Um, Can you say KBI or Kombucha Camp? KBI. Yeah, KBI yeah. is 2014. Right. And are noted authorities on the subject of this delicious and healthy fermented tea. We have a number of questions already submitted for Hannah, but please send any additional ones during the course of today's session. And there's a Q&A channel um, at the bottom of your screen. You should have a little Q&A icon. You can post them there. Um, so with that, Hannah, um, tell us about the, the new uh, code of practice for kombucha. And sure. So everyone knows, we'll, we'll, Hannah's going to talk for a while, and then we'll take some questions. We have some questions that have been sent ahead of time. So we'll send some of those, and then maybe Hannah will talk more, and maybe we'll have more questions, and, and um, we'll have no problem filling up the hour that we have allocated. Okay. That is true. I have some slides, so I thought I would just go ahead and share those. Um, and I'm just going to quickly touch through these slides. So um, there's going to be a lot of info on them, but we'll have fun. So here we are, Hannah and Alex, other Alex, my husband. Uh, we are a SCOBY. That means we're a symbiotic organism. And together, uh, you know, I discovered kombucha. My thirst dog grew my budget. I knew I had to do it myself. And that just inspired such a passion and love of this amazing drink. It created so many wonderful health benefits in my own life that I became an advocate. It just like, I feel like kombucha picked me and somehow I showed up to be the ambassador and I'm so grateful to be here. Um, and we really, you know, our whole mission is to help the world evolve into a healthier uh, state of being so that, you know, we can do the amazing thing that we know humans are capable of. And, um, you know, this all comes back to alcohol. The genesis of KBI is in this whole sort of misunderstanding about kombucha and alcohol. Every fermented food and drink, and those producers out there know this, create trace amounts of alcohol. But alcohol, for the vast uh, majority of these products, is there as a preventative. It to, it's to prevent mold, it's to prevent pathogens from going in the product, and it is not necessarily to intoxicate or inebriate. And trace amounts of alcohol can help us to absorb the nutrients better. So it has a very specific purposeful effect in products like kombucha, water, kefir, and, you know, a whole host of other types of fermented foods and drinks. But there is a controversy, or rather there's a um, technical definition of where kombucha gets taxed as an alcoholic beverage, and that's at 0.5%. And so back in 2010, there wasn't really much awareness around this, but um, it came to light that some products were tested off the shelf and they seemed to have more than half a percent alcohol by volume. And that created a trauma in our industry, a lot of chaos and confusion. And, you know, one of the things that came into question was, first of all, was there an uh, accurate testing method for ethanol and kombucha because it's such a trace amount 
the standard methods for testing alcohol for beer and wine, which are higher alcohol ferments, simply didn't capture those trace amounts. And so, um, but it created a sort of a trauma in our industry. And that trauma is what inspired us to come together. So it took a few years uh, to bring everybody together, but we did start KBI in 2014 with 40 founding brands. And I love the advice that Greg Cook gave us, and I'm an advocate of that. Now, some might say that's easy for me because I don't currently have a commercial kombucha brand. So it's easy for me to ask everybody to share their information. And truly, I feel like as Bacterio Sapiens, we're open source. So our nature is just like bacteria that freely exchange DNA in order to evolve. That's kind of what you know human beings are. We're based on the fact that we're Bacterio Sapiens and we require bacteria in order to run every aspect of our being. So it makes sense that we would then mirror them in these types of ways. So I'm a huge advocate of creating safe space for us to show up to discuss these issues in an open way and to come together and really figure out how we as a community can solve our problems together. Now there was a little bit of a crisis and chaos that that ensued and you know we didn't form a moment too soon because there were um, you know there's a kind of capitalism that exists around the world that is a little bit seemingly predatory or pathogenic or parasitic in the way that it presents itself because it creates an issue where there really wasn't one from a consumer perspective. And um, it was through that that then we started realizing, hey, we need to figure out a way to come together and to solve this issue. Now in my dream scenario, we all came together and we did a lot of research and we understood the health benefits of kombucha. We understood that the trace amounts of alcohol present in kombucha is not harmful. Um, but that's still a little bit ways down the road. Um, what we have developed though is the understanding that in order to be a compliant product, there are changes we can make to our process to how we make the kombucha in order to ensure that it does meet that, that federal limit. However, we know that sometimes ethanol levels can drift and that's why we've introduced the Kombucha Act is to just change that threshold, threshold for taxation from that half a percent up to one and a quarter percent. You know, around the world, they have different alcohol levels. In Canada, in most of the provinces, it's 1.15%. In Mexico, it's 2%. In Europe, it's 1.2%. In Australia, in many states, it's one15 And so there isn't a harmonized global standard for what's considered an alcoholic beverage. And that half a percent that the, you know, U.S. government developed back 100 years ago during Prohibition was without any consciousness of what kombucha is as a beverage. Nobody was selling it commercially 100 years ago. Um, and so this is really just a correction, a technical correction, so that our products are not pushed into a category that's inappropriate for them. You know, kombucha is a health beverage. People for hundreds of years all around the world have been enjoying it, enjoying the benefits of it, and it, it really has a positive effect on the human body overall. But it did highlight that we needed to define kombucha. And, you know, if we had put out that definition in 20, uh, 2014 or 2015, tea, sugar, scoby, that's really it. That's really what kombucha is. However, in the meantime, in order to meet this challenge of creating products that did fit that under half a percent goal meant that, um, you know, processes had to change, ingredients changed. Um, we saw different styles of kombucha being produced. And so that raised a question, well, how do we accommodate these changes that have taken place in our um, industry? How do we, um, make peace with the fact that this isn't going to stop. People are going to continue to make kombucha in a variety of different ways. And how do we create those healthy boundaries so that we're not preventing innovation from occurring, but we're also giving people the, the bumper, the bumpers, so to speak, so that they know exactly where their product falls. And so that is um, what we've tried to do. And we've done it with a lot of help. We've had a lot of folks in these conversations. We've engaged uh, law firms, a couple different law firms to help us uh, figure this out. We also engaged an FDA consulting firm because we really wanted this to be a living, breathing code of practice that everybody could get behind and again, we're trying to appease so many different people from so many different places. We're never going to come out with something that's going to make everybody, um, you know, be perfectly happy. The purists are going to say we're too lenient. Those who are making kombucha from base are going to, you know, not want to have to advertise that per se. And really what we're trying to do is just create transparency because we understand that, look, 
kombucha with a weird globby floaty thing in there is not necessarily every single consumer's idea of delicious. Um, it takes a special person who wants to put that really funky thing in your mouth with that flavor profile. I mean, how many times have I heard people say, I opened it up and I thought there was something wrong with it because it smelled so weird. So, um, you know, we want there to be products out there that bring people into our category that maybe have a more approachable flavor profile, that maybe have, um, you know, zero sugars because that's something that's important to them because we know once they're in to kombucha now they're going to have an opportunity to explore all the different variations of kombucha and so that's really what the code does is it just says here are different types of kombucha here's how we're going to label those products so then consumers can make that decision for themselves which is the product that resonates with me the most and not just resonates with me in this um you know one brand for life but as a category like some days you want to have a light and dry kombucha other days you want that fuller funkier one okay now i know i'm gonna go out drinking and i'm gonna you know want to have a little bit of a hangover cure i need that more um high powered kombucha versus one that's lighter and more soda like so there's going to be a kombucha for every time and place and flavor and and i'm excited that this means our category is just going to have an opportunity to continue to grow in that way and so, you know, this is but a small handful. When I say collaborators, do I mean every single person on this list wholeheartedly um, loves every aspect of the code? Of course not. But every single person here has contributed and then some. Well, you know, there's way more people who ha I've had conversations with, who've sent emails, who've shared their feedback one way or another that may not be represented here. So this is just a handful of the folks who have helped um, bring all of this information together. And you know, we're really excited to do code of practice. And we shifted from standard of identity, which is a very specific legal terminology into code of practice, because we wanted to have something that was flexible, that could evolve, we wanna be self-regulated. And, you know, it's not as simple as just filling out a form and sending it off to the FDA and having your standard of identity recognized. It's a bit of a political process. There has to be a reason why it's important for the FDA to spend their limited time and energy and resources on this topic. So what we're aspiring to is that this code will simply, as I said, create those healthy boundaries so that people know how to label their products, they know how to articulate what they've created. And assuming we're self-regulatory and, and people fall into alignment with that, then we may not need to pursue a more um, legal framework. And that just again, gives all of us the flexibility to continue to grow over time. And so we are anticipating that there'll be two seals. One will be a certified kombucha seal and the other will be traditionally fermented. And we're still in the process of developing exactly what those things mean. So again, there's still time to weigh in and offer feedback on this process. It is not over yet by, uh, by a long shot. So I'm excited to see the feedback we've been getting, both positive and negative, because all of it is what helps us to grow, right? If everything was just positive, we'd never be challenged to continue to evolve. And so um, we're excited that we get to continue to grow as we as our industry grows. But absolutely, we need a lot more research. Beer and wine have had millions, billions of dollars hundreds of years at this point, over 100 years of research and information. They completely understand their products. Yogurt, another product, very well studied. Um, things that we don't quite know about kombucha. Well, we want to understand how does changing the substrate impact the final product? If it's a yerba mate kombucha, what does that mean? Which organisms pl proliferate with a yerba mate kombucha or a coffee kombucha? What organic acids are present or missing? In what way do uh, herbs or other things impact or sugar types impact the nutritional value of our products. We are missing so much of that information. Um, we're putting together a kombucha sourness unit, just like an international bitterness unit for people to understand where does my taste fall? Am I going to be that sour, full, puckery kombucha person, or do I want the lighter, um, drier offering? And, and so this is going to help people better understand where they fall on that scale. We do have a style study in progress and it's open to kombucha, jun, water kefir, any sort of fermented beverage. We're trying to see if we can look at organisms as well as analytes to understand what types of, um, how they impact the flavor. So anyone is welcome to join us in this study. You can find more details there. Human trials, right? We have 
so much anecdotal information. So many, pe how many times have people written me and told me all about how kombucha has changed their life? How many of these kombucha producers out there? Look, kombucha is not a fast track to rolling in dough. <laughs> Any fermented food or drink beverage is a labor of love, emphasis on the labor. Right, you have to really be a passionate person to want to start this kind of business because it's something that's complicated, it's complex, it takes time, it requires you to educate others. And so really the people who are doing this are people who likely had a health challenge, they found that kombucha helped them in some way, or sauerkraut or whatever it is, insert fermented food here. And, and now they um, are wanting to give back to their community. They feel like, hey, this was so transformative. I need to share it. And I feel like, again, this is that bacterial desire to get information out there. When something feels good, we want to share that with other people so they feel good too. And um, we're just barely tip of the iceberg getting some human trial studies done. Um, in the next issue of Symbiosis Magazine, we'll be featuring a human trial done on kombucha and stress through um, Texas Christian University. Uh, Georgetown Medical, uh, Georgetown University Medical Center just recently did one looking at blood sugar levels and, you know, we don't have all the results yet, but it's looking pretty good. And so, again, these things that humans have attested to, you know, now let's, let's validate it. Let's understand it. Let's try to, to um, put the research together so that we can make those actual claims about our product because we've seen their positive benefits over, you know, hundreds of years. And there are other beverages that may want these similar types of guidelines coming down the road, right? Water kefir, kvass, fermented sodas. I mean, I think we're going to continue to see fermented beverages as a category proliferate. You're going to see, you know, um, single strain probiotics um, made by pharmaceutical companies or biotech companies make their way into the food supply. I personally find that those products are okay, but as we know, we want diversity. And so I truly believe that the traditionally fermented products are going to have that value proposition beyond a single strain that's going to be dumped into a bunch of different products. Um, and so again, they're going to be there and they're going to be beneficial and they're all going to work together. But I truly think that our traditional ferments are the ones that are going to make the most impact. And cultivating our culture, right? We've been so busy worrying about trying to get the definition of kombucha done. We haven't had as much time to focus on the fun of kombucha. Now that the code is out there and we can continue to take feedback and, and see how it proliferates in the marketplace, we can turn our sights to how do we judge kombucha? What are the, what's a rubric we can use? How do we hold up the brands, the flavors, the profiles, the creativity, the innovations that really speak to the spirit of kombucha, which is one of excitement and adventure and trying new things um, and being uplifted. So whether that's, uh, you know, the kombucha cup, <laughs> it's a work in progress. It may or may not be the kombucha cup, but, you know, creating some sort of awards for our industry. We have a research database with more articles we're going to be publishing so that people have accurate, well-researched information. You know, so often we see kombucha is a miracle cure or kombucha will kill you. So we have these very polar ranges of information we see about our product out there. And, you know, we want to have more of that rooted in the research information available for folks. And then a taproom tourism guide. I understand right now we're all uh, touring or traveling via Zoom, but at some point and in different parts of the world, things are going to open up. And where can you, as a kombucha person, look, the first thing I do when I land somewhere, where's the kombucha? Uh, what's the local brand? How do I get myself hooked up with some, some booch? I got to make sure I got some kind of local stuff to help me get into the local flora and fauna so I don't pay for it later. Um, you know, and, and this guide is intended to help people find kombucha around the world wherever they might go. Kombucha, Jun. So we're really excited to continue and shift our focus more to these areas um, as we move forward. And so We've got lots of great things going on. We're a dynamic and exciting industry and we're small but mighty. You know, we are a very small staff. I am there as a part-time president. We have a full-time assistant executive director and a couple of part-time administrators. 
as a young industry, we're also filled with businesses that oftentimes their owners are still working another job. They're doing this as a side hustle, but again, they're passionate about it. And so what that means is we just haven't had the same type of volunteer base that say a craft brew industry has had. Now they've also, they're also 30 years ahead of us. They've had a lot more time to grow their industry and, and for people to come and volunteer. But we're always looking for folks to come work with us. Um, we've got virtual KCON coming up in September as well. And so we know there's a lot of ways that we can continue to uh, grow together. And before, <laughs> before we get to the questions, let's just, let us embody the space, the energy, the aura of kombucha, right? Like what we need as human beings, especially now as we're, you know, our contact is limited, is to remember that we're all connected. We are all interconnected. There is no separation between any of us. Our actions impact others. And so normally this is something I would do where we'd all hold hands and be present, but instead we're gonna hold hands in our mind. We're gonna hold space in our minds. We're gonna just be so grateful that kombucha has brought us all here together to talk about these incredibly vital things and you know this is the transformation I see for the world right we're, it, we're in a state of such inflammation be that from a terrible diet from toxins in the environment from toxic information inflammatory information we're reading on social media all of this is designed to keep us in this state of heightened uh, response and our bodies don't have time to repair and heal but drinking that kombucha enjoying that water kefir grabbing your sauerkraut having some uh, tempeh or some koji crusted meat or whatever all of this is going to help calm down keep that response under wraps so that we can have the mental space to go about making the changes we need because uh, our structures are crumbling around us for a reason and we need healthy people and that means healthy in your gut your first brain because if this is out of order this is out of order and so it doesn't go the other way around it goes this way we need to get our guts right because that's going to give us the sanity we need to be able to make the changes so that everyone has an opportunity to flourish all right, so I will stop sharing my screen and I, I am that. ready. I love that last lots of slide. Questions. I love the I love the slide with the hands and the, the human scoby. I think that's just so so beautiful and it really um we're all in it together, you know. And uh, with the next the next little while in human history is gonna be interesting and I couldn't agree more with what you say that the the better equipped we are, um health-wise and spiritually and emotionally and physically, you know, that better things will go. Yeah, I mean, we've needed this for a long time. We, um, here in the United States, allopathy is the dominant form of um, medical care, and it's really great for traumatic situations. But when it comes to daily prevention and how we live our lives, I think we all understand we're better served to put healthier inputs into our bodies to have a healthier body, right? Um, it's just unfortunately our system is geared towards, you know, dealing with symptoms as opposed to root causes. And that's really the promise of fermented foods and why they've been around since the dawn of time is because they really do have a positive effect on the human body. Yeah. Are you ready for some questions? I am so ready for questions. Okay. We have a lot of them. Um, so this is a question from me, like, what role can I, Kombucha Brewers International, obviously for people, organizations who brew kombucha, what role, is there a role for just people who like kombucha? And like, what can you say about that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, kombucha lovers is, you know, these are our agents on the street, right? These are the people who are going to say, hey, friend, have you tried a kombucha? Oh my gosh, I had this horrible indigestion. I started drinking kombucha and now I'm feeling so much better. Do you want to try it? I see you're struggling with this, that or the other. So anyone who drinks consumer uh, kombucha is automatically a representative for our category because I mean, again, you hate to be that sort of person who's like, everybody's got to do this, but there really is that positive energy that comes from consuming these products that, that inspires people to want to share them. Kombucha evangelism. Yeah, I've, um, I've mentioned to, a, you know, a number of people I've talked to, I have much anecdotal 
storage of people who have started drinking kombucha and whose digestion has changed and they've been able to get off meds and all that. And it's not a double blind study, yada, yada, but it's um, stories from people I trust, including my mother. So um, that's- Well, and I think there's, there's, a, there's a valid place for anecdotal information. The reality is, is that the reason we ever study the underlying mechanisms of anything, which is really what science is for, right? Scientific method is a method of inquiry to understand why does something work the way it does. It's, but there's already an observable phenomena in place. Right. And so that's, that's what the science does is, you know, we hear about the observable phenomena. We are the test cases ourselves. We're the subjects. And now hopefully we can find a way to use the scientific method to more finely validate that information. Right. I mean, people discount the roles of intuition and hunches and all of that in the scientific process. But if you don't have a hunch or an intuition or some anecdotal stories, then how are you going to decide what to do a big, expensive, complicated study about? I mean, it absolutely comes from hunches or, you know, personal experiences or any of that. And that's why, in my opinion, it's been so unfortunate that people have tried to use the law against us because, you know, these are products that help people heal. These are products, look, and I'm not here to make a decision for anybody about what you should or shouldn't consume, but I've had family members, I've had many people tell me as former alcoholics that they drink kombucha and in fact it curbs cravings, it doesn't trigger them. Now that's a personal decision, that's a trust your gut situ situation. You have to decide if that's something you want to consume or not. But at least for my own life experience, I found that when I started drinking kombucha on a regular basis, my appetite for alcohol uh, diminished. Now, of course, I still enjoy my cocktail here or there, but I tell you what, if there's kombucha in it, I can have more of them. So yeah. that's always the, you know, we want to advocate bars and restaurants to have kombucha on tap or in bottles available because you'll just, your customer will be able to enjoy themselves longer without being as impaired. Not to mention designated drivers and, you know, give some, give people something exciting to, to drink, but yeah. Um, another question. I think a lot of people may not be familiar with the idea of kombucha made from base. You've, you mentioned it a couple of times. Can you say like a few words about that? Absolutely. You know, in our original verbiage, we were saying kombucha from concentrate. What we ran, which, you know, look, we looked, so when we decided, when we were looking at how do we define our products, we looked to other industries. We saw there were struggles in the orange juice industry. They ended up having to sue each other to make brands put from concentrate on their labels. Um, and as a consumer, we all know when we're going into a grocery store and we're seeing a fresh squeezed, unpasteurized, or a flash pasteurized, or a from concentrate, right? We're going to choose, you know, sometimes you need that frozen juice because you want to, you know, make sure you have it for when the end times come or whatever, right? Uh, there's, you're going to choose these different juice products for different reasons, and they're going to have different price points as a result. Um, however, when we kept proposing kombucha from concentrate, the feedback we were getting was that that isn't an accurate definition of concentrate. Concentrate indicates that at some point in the process, all of the water has been removed, and then it gets put back in at a later point. Since that's not what's happening with kombucha from base, we had to try to find a different terminology. Um, and so base represents this sort of um, middle product. It's called beverage base. It's often used in the soda industry. And it's that, you know, bag of flavored syrup that you then combine with sparkly water to create a soda. But nobody's going to buy the bag of syrup, unless, of course, you have a soda stream. But, right, uh, you know, that's that's not a product people are going to consume. And, um, and so that's where we, uh, we then had to look at a term of art that was already in use in the beverage industry to more accurately describe it. So basically what's happening is they're fermenting it to a vinegar state such that you wouldn't, it wouldn't be safe to consume. It needs to be diluted with water and other flavorings to be palatable, but that provides other opportunities for that product. So a lot of the products that are sweetened with stevia or have zero sugar calories, that's oftentimes what they're doing. Um, now I can't speak to everybody's process exactly what they're doing because we don't know that, but that's um, what kombucha from base is. Cool. Okay, here's a good question. I'll read it um, as as it was submitted. As a participant in such an involved and probably cumbersome process as developing this code from ideation to implementation, do you still see beauty in creating kombucha, or is it all just mechanics and policy? 
Oh, no, it's absolutely beauty. I mean, and this is the hard part about it. How do we distill art into science? And it's a little bit of both, right? The metrics can tell us certain things, but when it comes to putting that in your mouth, how do those metrics actually match? It may not always be easy to look at what's on the page and translate that to what's in your mouth. There certainly is a magic to fermentation. There's an art. Um, the art comes from, I mean, anytime anyone's tried to do it, look, how many people have tried to take up sourdough right now and their first bread may have turned out horrible, right? Because it isn't just following steps. We can have a recipe as a guide for any type of food, but it does not guarantee you success. What guarantees you success is practice, observation, putting your heart and energy into it and again because these are living sent you know living things there's an energy that's created when you work with them on a regular basis and so um, you know is a kombucha from base product the exact same as that ferment that's being done in a more traditional way no it isn't but that's exactly why we should give consumers the opportunity to choose the product that's right for them Mm -hmm. And also understand that like some products that are duking it out in price wars in the grocery store, there's a reason they're able to do that versus the small producer who's making that crafted product. And, you know, unfortunately, our country has really pushed the sort of bottom line mentality where we're only looking at how much does it cost my pocketbook, as opposed to what are the other implications of the products I'm purchasing. But then, of course, there's plenty of folks who are able to discern the differences. And I think it's important, though, that we as an organization are able to communicate to consumers consumers, what those differences are, and how they can make those informed choices. And really, um, we had to shift the perspective from, look, now brands are going to be brands, and they're going to say, my brand is better than yours, and this brand stinks over here. <laughs> That's brands. But as conceptually, what we want is diversity. And diversity means having a broad range of products, some of which the purists would stick their nose up at, and some of which, you know, other people are going to find the funky stuff too weird. So this is how we create diversity, is creating positive feeling for everybody. So none of these things like filtered or dealcoholized or from base are intended to denigrate those products. It's simply a, a word to distinguish how it's different from another product. Mm. Cool. Um... Oh, uh, let's see. This is an easy one, which you probably won't answer. Which is your favorite kombucha brand? My own. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Hannah's Homebrew. Okay. Uh, made with Hannah's Special Tea Blend. Um, it's the best tasting kombucha in the world. But, you know, that really is the answer. The answer is the one you make, the one yeah. that you put your energy into is just going to have that other flavor. Now, I will say when I'm out, if I don't know any of the local brands or it's hard to find one, I'm going to grab a GT's. Why? Because it's consistent. It's familiar. It has flavors I know and enjoy. Other brands, if I can get them that I also like to buy, Health Aid, Brew Doctor, these are going to be brands that I can find in almost any grocery store. But what I can't find here in California is Bucci, which is in um, North Carolina because they're a regional brand. They only have their products in a small area. But every time I'm in the South, I'm going to go find me a Bucci because I really love the bold flavors that they have. So I'm a huge fan of kombucha tourism and advocating you try the local brands. Some are good and some aren't. Um, but yeah, any brand is going to be better than no brand. Cool. Um, there, there are a bunch of questions specifically about the code. I'm going to ask, I'm going to, you know, angle towards those since that's what this uh, day is about primarily. So uh, here's a question. What guides the adoption of this code and who is obligated to use it? Self-regulation. So you're not obligated to use it, but in order to be participating in the SEAL program, you're gonna to need to meet the parameters of that program. Now, why be part of the SEAL program? Well, why, why pay to be organic? Why pay to be fair trade? Why be B Corp? Because those SEALs have a specific meaning and it's a shortcut to the consumer to say, hey, my product has been looked at, audited, investigated, and I'm found to be in compliance with this set of, of structures. And so that is, you know, if you can have that seal on your bottle and consumers instantly understand what that means, 
then they're going to gravitate towards those products because they don't have to do the guesswork of, is it, isn't it? I have to discern this. There's so many things we have to discern these days as consumers because unfortunately our government allows so many toxic chemicals into our food supply. And so, you know, we get ingredient list reading fatigue. It's exhausting to have to constantly, oh, so how are they calling high fructose corn syrup these days? Uh, you know, uh, what are they calling GMOs? Like, how am I supposed to understand what I'm putting in my body? Because they're constantly changing the language. Well, the seal will be that quick shortcut so you understand that the product has been through that, that process. And it is, it's open to everybody. So you do not have to be a KBI member. And in fact, KBI is not the ones who are gonna be looking at your submission, similar to USDA organic. The USDA sets the organic regulations, but they are not the ones who are auditing or, or issuing the seals. So um, we're gonna have a third party collecting that information, but then the seal will be licensed by KBI. So they're doing it in accordance to the code, to what we're putting in place, but then we aren't in charge of that because, again, we're not a regulatory agency. We're not here to come into your facility and check up on you and, you know, chide you or scold you or whatever. We're here to promote trade. We're here to promote the category. We're here to promote, um, you know, people getting into kombucha and understanding what it is. Cool. Okay, I'm going to combine a couple of questions here. Um, question about best practices for getting consistency across batches and also like supplier lists for teas and sugar sources. So one of the questions says, uh, uh, especially in terms of ethical practices for the, for the suppliers, for example, we have a major ethical conflict with a particular brand um, and yet it's a huge player in the industry, even though it's organic. So like, um, I guess to generalize that, like, is there is there a collection of best practices and advice, I guess, for for kombucha makers, and is that one of the roles that KBI plays? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and you know, again, we're also not here to tell everybody how to do their business. Do I like that um, brands were narking on other brands to the TTB, or that they were, um, you know, instigating consumer class action lawsuits against other brands? No, I don't think that's a great way for our our industry to. Uh, build itself up. It just creates division. It creates chaos. It tears things apart. We, we need to be unified on the same page. And I understand that we want to talk about how our brand is better or this or that, but then we need to do that through our own advertising about touting the benefits of our brand, not necessarily putting other brands down. That, that personally is just not, I get it, right? Like that's just marketing, that's advertising. Brands are going to choose to, to do that if they want. But really as an association, what we're here to do isn't to tell everybody how they're supposed to um, advertise their products, although I would love to develop a code of ethics around that um, and, and see what we can do to create that, because that does exist in other industries. So I think that is something we'd like to develop down the road. Again, not to be, you know, chiding people, but if people are egregiously abusing um, that, then of course we need to have a way in order to understand that. Hmm. Okay, here's a quick one. Is the code intended to be international or is it just for US producers? No, it's absolutely international. The idea is to have a harmonized standard because it doesn't make sense to have a definition of kombucha here and a definition of kombucha there. Now I will say that um, our KBI Europe group is tearing the code apart as we speak and I can't wait for our next committee meeting in August where we'll dive into all of their questions and concerns. And here's the thing, the code, admittedly may not be perfect the way it's written right now. And that's the idea behind having a code, knowing that as human beings, we're gonna to wanna to continue to change, evolve, refine, improve. And that's what the code allows us to do. So we welcome all feedback. If you're not sure how to get in touch with this, admin at kombuchabrewers.org or our contact form on our website. Um, you know, at some point we'll probably create a form specific for the code for people to show up and share comments, but, um, you know, this is, we're, we're just excited to, to get this out here so that people, like, again, we could have, tw 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 we could have, you know, extended this process even further. And, you know, we have to have it absolutely perfect before we put it out. But then, you know, now we're allowing other products to proliferate in the marketplace with the word kombucha that may or may not really be fitting the value proposition of kombucha. And so, you know, to create less confusion, it makes sense to have a code out now. And do you have a process in place already for um, discussion and for the next, you know, coming up with the next revision of the code and, and like a timeline for that or how, how does that work? 
Yeah, we don't have a specific timeline in mind right now. I think we're going to be collecting feedback on an ongoing basis. You know, we don't even have a technical committee. Really, the committees we have are regional committees. <laughs> and those are committees designed to make sure that we're interfacing with our brands all over the world, meeting their needs, helping them with any challenges. You know, we helped um, KBI uh, brands in Brazil when they were working with their local FDA called MAPA in developing a, a Brazilian standard of identity. Their standard and their law is actually a bit more strict than the standard we've developed. Um, you know, they very much define it as tea sugar SCOBY, whereas we allow for yerba mate and things like this to be used in the primary fermentation. So um, again, we want this to be something, it's not that one size fits all and we know there might be some slight tweaks and that's also why we have the ethanol chart that that indicates the ethanol, you know, for non-alcoholic, ethanol for taxation, ethanol for labeling, because these can be at different levels in different places. And so, and it's actually really confusing to try to compile that information. So um, we are sensitive to the fact that, um, you know, people around the world might have different ideas about how they want to call the product, but I think the closer we can get to harmonize, the easier it's going to be for consumers to just understand what they're drinking, regardless of where it's coming from. Mm. If, you, if you had one piece of advice for somebody who's just starting a new kombucha business, um, what might it be? Um, Labor of love, emphasis on labor. Just be ready to work hard. It, it is exhausting work. There's no doubt about it. There's no way to sugarcoat it. I mean, you're lifting heavy jars. And if you're not, then you're pushing heavy equipment around. And if you're not, you're hand labeling every bottle. And if you're not, you're hand screwing every bottle cap on. And if you're not, you're spending tons of money to have machinery to do that for you. So most brands are not going to have a bottling machine in their first even five years of existence. And so you have to get okay with the fact that what you're doing, part of why you're doing it is because you feel passionate about it, not just because you're, you know, you're just going to make kombucha and make a ton of money. Um, it, it, it is something that does require that, and that may shy you away from it, or you might be the kind of person who's like, I'm just going to do this. And, you know, that's why I think there's got to be an opportunity for people at all sizes, not just for there to be big brands, but also little brands. We need little brands. Have you seen a change in the, in the way that kombucha companies have been financed over the last little while? Like I imagine the first ones, like, you know, GT started out of his garage and he would answer the phone and, and pretend to be like the president and the chief bottle capper and all the above. Cause he was right. But, um, how, how has that changed since, since the very first companies? There can only ever be one first to market by the very definition, right? First to market is the first to market. And, you know, I, I think it, it's going to be difficult to build a brand like GT's, which hasn't taken outside investment as far as I know. Um, and, you know, it, but I don't think outside investment is the only way you can grow a brand. Um, again, it really depends what's the goal of your brand. Do you want to be that national brand that's everywhere? Well, then you probably will need to take on investment. When you take on investment, that means you're selling part of your company, which means you're selling part of the decision making process. And so, you know, it's what's more important to you. Do you want to be um, do you want to be in full control of your product and process or do you want to share some of that responsibility in exchange for investment? You know, some will say that we're starting to see some slippage in sales. And I would say that's because there's a lack of diversity on the shelves. Some are mm -hmm. saying the kombucha set is looking really good now, but I disagree. I think we need, you know, back when Whole Foods wasn't owned by Amazon and they really cultivated the local brands, we saw a proliferation of diversity on store shelves that gave consumers that chance to try the local product with the local stuff. Now what we see now that it's owned by Amazon is, you know, we're only getting the major brands and, you know, that's good. It's better than nothing to have that in the grocery stores, but I still would love to see um, retailers taking on more of the small local brands and giving them a chance. Um, okay. We've had a few questions saying like, what are the exact details for, getting the seal, getting certified, what's the process, what's the cost? Is it detailed on your website? It's still in process. Yeah, in we're process. still developing that whole process. So we are continuing to work with, um, uh, with a firm that's developing it with us. Uh, now these people have great experience. Uh, they worked with um, White Wave back in the days when soy was really new and 
worked with GMO labeling. And so these are people who very much understand how these structures work. An initial version was suggested built off of SQF principles, which is, um, or G, G, F, I always mess this abbreviation up, GCFIS. I think I put one letter in there too much, but in any case, it's these global standards for safety, right, for food safety, but those can be really expensive and they can be difficult for people to, um, to reach. And so we want to make this approachable. We want to make it affordable um, because there's no point in having a seal if you can't get it. And then we're also going to be creating education around it because again, why have a seal if we're not teaching you how to have your product comply with the seal? So there's a lot more work that we need to do before the role out of that, which is why it's going to come in 2021 as opposed to later this year. Cool. Okay, here's a question. Um, there's an organization that captures reports about the health benefits of fermented foods. It says this question, like, can you confirm the name of that? And like, if people have other beverages, like there's a fermented coconut milk kefir or water kefir or other similar beverages, like, um, how how does one get or how how did you find was best to get um scientific journals researchers etc interested in what you're doing in the u.s and in other countries i mean that's sort of kind of a big question um, it's a lot it's a lot of questions rolled into one um yeah. the short answer is uh you know they found us uh, people weren't necessarily doing a research on kombucha, but then they Googled it. They found Kombucha Brewers International. We very much advocate for research, and so we were able to connect folks to it. You know, as Kombucha Camp, we've worked with Tufts. They did a huge, um, you know, home brewer SCOBY survey that we helped, you know, send that out to our list of, of people so that they could get more participants and, you know, a mass, uh, you know, and we weren't they worked with us and other people to do that. So um, we, we've we long wanted more and more research. And in fact, we fought to make sure that the research stayed in our book. Um, there was sort of a push to make it more of just a cookbook and we really weren't happy with that. We, we, we made sure that that research stayed in there because to us, that is part of what's really important about kombucha is it's not just a fad, it's not just a fairy tale. It really does have research behind it that demonstrates that the nutrients, the elements, the acids it creates have a positive effect on the human body. So how do we get them excited and involved, well, we sure would love to start a research committee too. Um, so uh, bringing together people who are doing studies, putting out a call for, you know, what are other types of studies people can do. And so anyone who's studying kombucha, we invite them to contact us, to reach out to us. This is how we got our collaborations going. Um, for example, the study in Texas, we were able to connect them with a local supplier um, who provided all the kombucha to the study for free. So that really helps because research is so expensive here in the US, it really helps to have those types of partners. Um, same with uh, Georgetown. We were able to connect them with a local supplier who helped them get the products they needed for their study. So we're here to act as an intermediary. Um, we've reached out to other folks and they said, no, we don't want your help or participation because we want to be perceived as neutral. And that's fine too. Again, we're not trying to influence the outcome of the research, but we want to support it any way we can. Cool. That was a good and answer. And then in terms of like water kefir, kvass, all of those, like, you know, KBI has a membership level for that. What we don't have though, while we have like has a plan template and a ton of free webinars and information and education that's really kombucha specific, um, we don't have that full library of water kefir information of other types of um, fermented beverages, but we do have a membership for it. So if there's might, if there's people who want to show up and help contribute in that way, we are here again to hold that space. We really think of ourselves as like the um, low alcohol traditional fermented beverages organization right. but you know consumers know what kombucha is they may not have heard of um, you know tibicos or um, whey soda or things like that you're an ecumenical organization um what was i gonna ask oh yeah can you say the name of your magazine because you it was on a slide but you didn't you haven't talked about it much and, symbiosis. and also, yeah symbiosis right do you have a copy you can hold up so that people can see it <laughs> my hard copy still hasn't arrived um because <laughs> that's exciting i hadn't known about that it was the first time i saw it i presume people can subscribe yes. on your website 
and it'll have articles about the research and like all that, right? Symbiosismag.com or symbiosismagazine.com. You can find it there and it'll have the link to where you can grab your copy. It is the official journal of the kombucha industry. And so it's going to have profiles of our members. It's going to include this research. It has several columns, including brewing, um, technical advice, regulatory advice, advocacy. Uh, we also have kombucha cocktail recipes and um, the first issue has a whole feature on PR and leveraging press to your benefit. Uh, it also has a worldwide kombucha survey, so sort of a snapshot in time of how many kombucha brands, their penetration in different countries, which also then reveals the per capita information and where the opportunities are. You know, we think, oh gosh, there are so many brands here, there couldn't possibly be any more, but the reality is per capita wise, that's not true. There's a huge opportunity for kombucha in most places. Mm -hmm. And um, so this next issue, which will also feature the taproom tourism guide is gonna have articles, you know, how do we open a tap room? now that we're also dealing with COVID? What are some lessons learned from other industries? How can we, um, what are some other ways we can get our product to market? Uh, one of the pieces is going to look at the different vans, right? People will convert a van into a kombucha dispensing station and, and how can that be leveraged to get kombucha to folks? And, and you know, what are some of the creative ways producers are, are looking towards to collaborate with other artisanal food uh, purveyors and create sort of custom CSA boxes or or going to online or contact free delivery. So we're, we're trying to get as much as this information in there, partially as a snapshot to sort of catalog where we are as an industry, but also to really get practical information into people's hands. Cool. I, I, I'm going to say there are a lot of questions. A lot of people have asked a lot of really good questions. And obviously, we're not going to have time to answer all of them. I think most of these questions, you can contact Kombucha Brewers International. And some of these questions, they can probably answer pretty quickly. And some of them might be bigger projects and you can hire KBI to consult, right? Or I, well, I you know. mean for like brands needing help? Um, so there's yeah. a small a like, pool. Specific, like technical questions. Yeah, I mean, some of the technical questions are going to be answered in the information in our members forum. So that's a great place. We also have all of the PDFs of KCON presentations passed. One of the benefits to that is we've been really um, lucky to have SPINs uh, provide a, a snapshot of our industry every year. So from 2014 to 2019, we have SPINs data on our industry. What that's really great for is anyone out there building their um, business sales deck, like uh, trying to articulate the opportunity of kombucha and fermented drinks that information paints a really clear picture of how the industry has grown and that's in addition to things like how to cost a case with a with a template worksheet there with our um, you know HACCP template so before we just told you sort of how to fill it out now we actually have a whole template that you can fill in and it's got that kombucha brewing specific info you just need to customize it to what you're doing um, but in terms of like getting one-on-one -on -one help that's more um, and so what we're trying to do with that is we have these monthly roundtables we're doing sort of a mutual mentoring where we show up we talk about a topic but then we ask each other questions and we share and so that's always been my goal is to get more people sharing information because that's what knits the community closer together you know something I always say at kombucha con is hey look around the room these are the people who are going to be your friends for the rest of your life, <laughs> assuming you're going to stay in kombucha. So why not get to know them now? Why wait till later? You yeah. know, start making those relationships, connect with people. And again, because of sort of the drama that's occurred heretofore, it's created a secrecy, a silence, but that's what we're consistently trying to break through and help people come together so that they can talk about these things. Yeah, a rising tide raises all the ships. Is that what they say? Yeah, rising tide, rising tides, growing strong culture, and the theme for virtual KCON is cultivating resilience. So mm -hmm. we always come at you with an ing verb and something we're doing with that verb um, because we feel that's a really dynamic way to present our information. And um, so yeah, we're excited. Our topics for virtual KCON are really great. We're going to have um, a self care for entrepreneurs panel. We have a hard kombucha. We have uh, spins and they're going to be breaking out that hard kombucha category as well because that's become super popular for folks so um you know as always we deliver on the content and so we hope that folks and because it's virtual the price point is a little more affordable plus now you don't have to pay for travel so we're hoping that this will allow the information to get to a bigger audience but all of these details can be found at kombuchabrewers.org yes send us your questions and please be patient with us as i mentioned we are a small staff but we really do want to help and and get answers to you. 
Cool. A bunch of questions about like alcohol testing for both home and large scale kombucha production. Like how do I do it? How do I know I'm not producing alcohol? How do I know how much? Yeah, so you're never not producing alcohol. So that's the short answer there. You are producing alcohol because the only way the acetic acid ferment works is by converting alcohol. So that is the essential proposition of kombucha. We're making vinegar, we're making tea vinegar. And how that happens is first alcohol has to be present so that it can convert to the acetic acid. So that's the short answer there. How do you test it is a bit trickier. If you're a commercial producer, we have a whole page on the KBI website under the resources tab called KBI approved ethanol testing methods. And it also lists some of the pieces of equipment you can buy. There are starting to be some lower cost pieces. They're still a little complicated to use. Like it's not just a dipstick or, right? It's, it's, it's a whole process you have to engage in. But there are some more affordable um, devices coming out that, you know, a home brewer looking to be commercial might actually want to invest in, but they tend to start at a thousand. There's not much for less than a thousand dollars. So at that point, if you just want are curious, then you might um, send it out to a lab those tests are probably going to cost less, but it's also like trying to understand what method they're using. And that page will educate you about which methods you should be asking for. So the ways that beer brewers do it with hygrometers and all that, that doesn't apply. It doesn't work as well for kombucha. It doesn't because acetic acid and ethanol apparently are really close in terms of their weight. And a lot of those measurements are based on density. So um, the sugar is denser in the water. And when that sugar converts to alcohol, it's lighter. And so by tracking that change in sugar to alcohol by density, you get a really accurate information for higher alcohol products. Because kombucha tends to be very trace, typically no more than 2% unless you're, you know, adding a ton of extra fruit in a secondary fermentation. But a traditionally fermented kombucha is, you know, going to be 0.2, maybe to 1%. It, again, it only gets higher depending on what we're flavoring it with, et cetera. But, um, you know, those trace amounts are going to be more difficult to test at home. And so that's where the lab would be the better way to go. There's no way you can interpolate based on the pH of how much acid there is and versus the alcohol. Well, this is what we're hoping to uncover. There may be a way to understand ethanol to acetic acid conversion, but again, the research isn't there yet. So we would love um, any researcher or PhD student who hears this plea for help, um, you know, we'd love to figure out if there's a table similar to what you find in the beer and wine industry where we could track that based off of um, a metric such as the acidity. Now, again, testing the acetic acid and titratable acidity is a bit of a chemistry process. So at this point, we don't have any like stick in the pH paper and now I know the answer type of technologies available for our products. Will we see them in the future? Who knows? Right, sounds like a good, uh, like you said, good product for a PhD a doctoral thesis or something like that. Yeah, one of the new products that's out there for testing ethanol came from a student who, uh, in engineering, who wanted to start a kombucha company and had so much trouble testing his brew, he decided to make a tester. And so that's what he's focused on now. Um, we have a little more time, but what, what do you have, do you have any, any, since we started a little late, do you have any thoughts just about kombucha in general or like trends in kombucha, like maybe like hard kombucha or, you know, what, what, what do you see, what do you think we're going to be talking about in a year or two that seems like, hmm. Where, where are things going? Any ideas? Yeah, well, I think the category is just getting started. What are we going to hear about? We're going to hear about like, custom, you know, special fancy teas as being the only flavoring, right? So you're going to have these products that focus on high quality tea and the fermentation of that similar to like wine, right? Like wine is the fermentation of a particular type of grape or combination of grapes to yield a profile. And so rather than adding, um, you know, ginger herbs, fruits, et cetera, in secondary, we're, we're going to continue to see more of those types of premium uh, kombuchas emerge. I think we're going to 
ultimately see sort of, you know, higher end brands, brands that are in larger bottle sizes, uh, because it's like, instead of grabbing, you know, wine or whatever for the party, let's pick up a 750 milliliter bottle of kombucha and bring that to share instead. I think hard kombucha, we're definitely going to see more innovation there. Um, you know, there's a lot of really great brands. Uh, Boochcraft is doing the presentation for us at, at Virtual Kombucha Con, and we're really excited to hear what they have to say. But, you know, Dr. Hops, I just had some of that the other day, very hot. Um, which I like hops in my kombucha it was a little it was a little more on the IPA side for my personal profile um, but you know again there and that's the beauty of it right there's gonna be a flavor for everybody um, you know unity living vibration out of Michigan was one of was the first brand to try to make a hard kombucha um, after 2010 they decided they didn't want to sacrifice any um, of their recipe to processing or things like that they applied for a TTB license and you know they they were the first to market with that product and it's exciting to see how others are picking that up and, and uh, running with it and creating all these really interesting products that I think, you know, consumers these days, as we're shifting out of the love of processed foods, you know, processed foods was a status symbol post World War II. And we've come to the point where like, it's hard for people to know how to cook because they're so reliant on processed foods. Um, but as we're shifting back towards quote unquote, real foods, traditional foods, foods that deliver more than just a fun flavor profile, but also a benefit. This is why I think we're going to continue to see kombucha proliferate in the hard space and Jun as well, Jun June tomato, tomato, kefir, kefir. Um, <laughs> but I think that does also mean from the non-alcoholic side, there's a lot of opportunity for the kefir waters and the kvasses. And, you know, I just think we're going to get more bubbly and more fun because that's what people need anyways. And people are looking for products that have that benefit. And I think, again, this is an opportunity to sort of reunite soda companies with their, you know, pharmaceutical history, if you will, right? Like uh, Coke supposedly started in pharmacies and it was a special combination of medicinal herbs and elements that was then combined with soda water. And over time it got turned into... Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and cocaine, right? Because that was medicinal That's at fair. the time. Yeah. Um, and, you know, and that that has shifted to, you know, this very inexpensive product that unfortunately has negative um, outcomes uh, for people's health. Most sodas, right? Not just one brand or another. But, um, you know, and my hope, of course, is that with Kavita being owned by Pepsi, that they start to, hey, let's give you know, sports players the chance. Can they have a Gatorade or a Kavita? Like, it'd be nice if we could mix and match and, you know, get some airtime for kombucha and these types of products. We've seen brands like Hum was in the Seattle, uh, I'm not going to, Seattle Mariners, Seattle, maybe it was their football team. But in any case, I know they've been in stadiums. We've seen brands get into stadiums. And again, it's that great alternative fun product with a slightly higher price point that um, consumers can really enjoy and get that benefit from. So I think we're just going to keep seeing more creativity, more imagination, more sophistication, because as consumers become educated about the product, it isn't just, oh, this is kombucha. It's like, oh, there's coffee kombucha and yerba mate kombucha and, you know, hard kombucha for when I want to party. And then there's this kombucha that's really light and almost like a soda, um, you know, so there's going to be kombucha for everybody. Okay. I think on that note, we are at time. And um, that seems like a good note to end on, like the, the, the bright future of kombucha and, and, um, and the variety and fellowship of kombucha. So um, I think that's it. So Thank you very much, Hannah, for, yes. for coming and, and sharing your, your articulate, uh, biodiverse thoughts and, and energy with us. And it's, it's really been a pleasure having you here. Thank you for having me. And I'm, I'm just grateful to have the opportunity to share with you guys. So thanks again to TFA for hosting us. We're all in this together and we all love fermentation. So I'm grateful to have a chance to, to share here. Thank you. Okay, and thank you to the audience. Thank you for coming and thank you for your interest in kombucha and your support of kombucha and um, everything that it does for everyone. <laughs>